a satellite image of the Holy Land, peaceful and serene on a picture-perfect, cloudless day. A small piece of territory in comparison to many others, yet one that has an unusually rich history of conquest and dominion. It sits at one of the world's most significant geopolitical crossroads. Here, the nations have struggled for millennia, determined to have a place in this arena of world events. But it's not just in the realm of power and politics that this holy land has seen conflict. Jerusalem is home to three of the world's religions. It continues to invite our attention. Looking back over its religious history, you might say it's also a theological crossroads. When it comes to Christianity, there's an equally rich history of conflict and conquest. But what would the founder of Christianity have made of all of the blood spilled here, supposedly in his name? There is an immense contradiction between what he taught and all that has happened. What did the earliest teachers of Christianity have to tell their world? Does original Christianity still exist? Have Jesus' teachings enjoyed accurate transmission across the years? Or is the Christianity we know today, in part, accumulated misconception? New scholarship and the findings of archaeology are contributing to a realignment of thinking about the roots of the world's most widely distributed religion. Christianity now has over 1.7 billion adherents. Hello, I'm David Hume. Please join me for the next hour as we take a surprising and often revealing look at the life and times of Jesus of Nazareth and how we have misunderstood, misperceived, and misquoted the first Christians. We're up above the Hula Valley in northern Israel. This is the Muslim fortress of Nimrud in the foothills of Mount Hermon, close to today's borders with Lebanon and Syria. Built in the 1200s, it was designed as a protection against the European Crusaders. Beginning in 1095, the Pope had encouraged these religious warriors to take back the Holy Land from the Muslim Turks and restore it to Christendom. This fortress now stands a silent testimony to those blood-soaked times. The period of the Crusades was one that most would rather forget. It was a time of misguided fervor that has led some to conclude that Christianity lost its way a long time ago. But the Crusades are just one example over the past 2,000 years of how humans have contradicted early Christian teaching. In the 19th century, the Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard said it well when he wrote, Millions of people over the centuries have little by little cheated God out of Christianity. It's a shocking and bold statement. What did he mean by it and what can be done? Years later, in the second half of the 20th century, the French writer Jacques Ellul wrote, We have to admit that there is an immeasurable distance between all that we read in the Bible and the practice of Christians. These are not altogether uncommon thoughts. A lot of us suspect that something fundamental and vital has gone missing between the earliest days of Christianity and now. It's also a surprising fact that the Bible is the most misquoted and misunderstood book of all. 
This has led to many misconceptions. It's led to many of the Bible's stories being retold inaccurately. Kierkegaard made an even more telling remark when he said, the Christianity of the New Testament simply does not exist. If this is a true statement, then perhaps it's time to go back and rediscover the authentic faith. And here in the land where the New Testament began is the place for us to start. We begin with the most familiar account of all, the first Christmas. Or was it? Could it be that we've got it significantly wrong? Every year in the closing days of December, the town of Bethlehem is filled with pilgrims, acknowledging what they believe was the time of their Savior's birth. But does the traditional Christmas story reflect what the Bible and certain facts of history tell us? You might be surprised. Two thousand years ago, the Mediterranean basin was a Roman-dominated world. Just before Jesus' birth, Roman records show that the Emperor Caesar Augustus issued a decree calling for a census. Nothing unusual in that, this emperor had called for several such reckonings during his reign. This one was his last one and came in 8 BC. The next one came under a different Caesar, Tiberius, in 14 AD. Now the Romans allowed about five years for a census to be completed. The New Testament writer Luke tells us that Jesus' parents, Joseph and Mary, were required to travel from Nazareth to their ancestral home in Bethlehem in Judea to register and be counted. So far then, we can say that Jesus was born after 8 BC. In addition, we can say that he was born not later than 4 BC. Why is that? Again, the New Testament gives us a clue. Matthew's Gospel shows that the birth of Jesus took place while Herod was king of Judea. It's established from secular records that Herod ruled from 37 to 4 BC. So Jesus was born at the time of a Roman census and shortly before Herod died. That's to say, Jesus was born around 4 BC. Now you might ask, how did the Western world come to adopt a system of counting time in terms of before and after the birth of Christ if he was born BC? Where did the idea come from of dividing time into A.D., Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord, and B.C., before Christ? Surprisingly, it wasn't until 526 that a Scythian monk, Dionysius Exiguus, living in Rome, came up with this method of Christian dating. And it wasn't until a thousand years later, in the 1500s, that B.C. came into use. It gradually became a common misconception that Christ was born at the division of the years between B.C. and A.D. But the few historical benchmarks given in the New Testament give no support to such a conclusion. Here in Jerusalem, it's claimed that 2,000 years of Christian history are being commemorated. But since we know that Jesus was not born in 1 AD, the year 2000 has nothing to do with the 2000th anniversary of his birth. Not only has the year of his birth been miscalculated, but so has the day. Many people now admit that December 25th could not have been the day of his birth. Most likely, Jesus was born in the autumn. We could make a strong case for this general period from specific details in the Gospel of Luke. The priests who served at the temple in Jerusalem had well-defined cycles or rotations. John the Baptist's father was one of those serving in Jerusalem from time to time. He served in the rotation named after Abijah, 
head of one of the priestly families in the days of King David. The timing of the Abijah course was around July-August. The Gospel of Luke tells us that John the Baptist was conceived just after one such visit by his father to Jerusalem. And we also know from Luke that John was about six months older than Jesus. So we can show by simple arithmetic that John the Baptist was born in the springtime in Palestine and that Jesus was born about six months later. As we continue with this history of early Christianity, we'll discover several more important misconceptions and we'll show why these discrepancies are significant.